Oh, look yonder there. <laughs> That's a Joan. It's farther away. <laughs> Welcome to the Muzzle Blast podcast from the National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association. Muzzle Blast is made possible by the membership of the NMLRA. Thank you. Well, I'm Navio Accolini, and I've been a member of the National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association for 51 years. What got you started in all of this? I don't think I've ever well, really talked to you about that. Um, the, um, well... My dad, was, I always called my dad Park Beaver. He, uh, <laughs> uh, I grew up in a small family-owned restaurant in Massachusetts. And my dad was a top-notch golfer, and we always belonged to the local golf club. And the wealthy, of course, there was a lot of wealth in that part of New England, a lot of, a lot of manufacturing owners, a lot of doctors, a lot of lawyers and stuff, business people. So they frequented not only the country club but also the restaurant and my grandmother was the chef she was really the owner of the restaurant my dad went in business with her my mom worked as a lab uh, technician at the local hospital and then at night the restaurant was open at five so from five until midnight my parents my grandmother worked there so I was left pretty much on my own from very early age mm -hmm. fortunately the restaurant had a basement and my dad had a nice big workbench with a vise and some hand tools and whatnot. So from age three or four, I was in the basement making arrowheads out of slate. And then, you know, eventually uh, you get into BB gun and then yeah. 22s. And, of course, at 12, I was given a bow and arrow. So in the, the back, you, you go out of the back of the restaurant, and the woods were that close and went on for miles. It just it, the woods were, were my playground, and there was nobody that lived close to me. We were out, out of the, even though it was a little bitty town, I was on the outskirts of town, about two and a half miles. So, I was kind of I didn't have any brothers or sisters, and you know I, I, I would have loved to have a brother to do things, and right. I made things. I built a log cabin. I built bridges over, or I did with my friends. It, bridges over uh, several of the streams and there was you know always hunting and fishing and camping and I was in the Boy Scouts and then my best friend from uh, high school from uh, grade school all the way through high school lived quite a, quite a ways away and when I go back to see my parents I, I would see him and and, uh, and uh, he was a hunter and uh, Massachusetts just was putting in the the black powder hunting season uh, Probably about 1980, most states didn't have a black powder hunting season for deer. Really? And, and the, you'll have to ask your dad because he'd probably know the, the facts, but Thompson Center Company started manufacturing a fairly inexpensive black powder rifle mm, that was I, very dependable, but it was a percussion. Yeah. I think you could get flint, but point, like for $125 or 150 bucks, you'd get this, this gun, whereas if you ordered one here, there'd be seven, eight, nine hundred dollars $900, right. but they'd be more fancy, of course. So uh, John would ask me to bring powder or shot or, you know, different things. And then uh, eventually I made him a Chief's grade uh, French tool, which is about 18, 20, 18, 40 period, nice big hunting gun. And uh, so one time I went back there and he said, uh, you know, I, I know you like to make things. Do uh, you think you could make a bow for my son? He, he, ha he has a compound bow and he's killed so many deer with it, he needs a challenge. So I said, well, I always wanted to make a bow, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, I don't know anybody that, that does it, uh, but I hear hickory is a good wood, and I don't have any hickory on my property in Indiana. He said, not to worry. I work at a state park in New Hampshire. I'll get you a, a hickory tree. So he, he got me this big log of, of hickory, and I split it up, put part of it in my dad's basement back east, took part of it out here, went to work in, in April, started because uh, that was from October to April, the drying, I take it out to work, and I show it to this Native American. I said, what do I do next? And he goes, take off more wood. So I go home. <laughs> I come back, and what do I do next? Take off more wood. You know, and it wasn't even, it was looking like a two-by-four. Uh, uh, and finally, one of his workers said, oh, you're trying to make a bow? I said, yeah. Uh, I said, but I don't know what I'm doing. He said, well, I've been working on this water heater on Sergeant's Row, and a guy's got all these wooden bows. Maybe he knows something about it. What's his name? What's his name? He said, ah. you know, I worked on so many. I said, the next time you go over there and, and, and see him, get his name and phone number, and I'll buy a case of beer. So he called me on August 16th, 
Now here I am trying to work on this boat from April and can't do anything until August 16th. And uh, so I called the guy. He said, oh, you really want to make a bow? I said, yeah. yeah. I said, have you made bows before? He says, yeah, I made a few. And uh, he said, come on over after work. So I, I'm in a three-piece suit, you know, and I go over to Sergeant's Row and, and I park the car in the back of a, the, the, they have a row of houses that, they, that the soldiers are in. And he's an enlisted man. And so his wife comes out the back door and she greets me and she has this heavy Italian accent. She said, would you like some wine and then maybe some prosciutto with melon? And I'm going, I like these people already. I haven't even met the guy yet. <laughs> and, and he's changing his clothes, you know. So he comes over, introduces himself. Real nice guy, part pro-Indian. Um, and uh, we immediately just liked each other. So we got to get, I have him come up to the house on the weekend. I show him all my woodworking tools. I didn't. I, I had to build a barn like this when I, when I got into it, but I didn't have the barn then. I just had my garage. But I had a lot of stuff around my muzzle loading stuff. Uh -huh. He was impressed, and, and I said, "Yeah, I got a friendship. You got to come down there with me and camp." So you know, one thing led to another. He taught me how to make bows, and that's how I got into the bow thing. The, the quick story about how the, the hunting uh, or the muzzle loading and how I ended up here was in college, getting my working on a PhD, and Uncle Sam, not uh, Vietnam, nineteen sixty eight, heavy on protests everywhere, people are getting drafted left and right, get people getting killed. So when I went to Detroit for an interview uh, it, at Cobo Hall, it was right after Martin Luther King was, was assassinated, and people were uh, on curfew in Detroit, <laughs> and I saw jeeps with machine guns and soldiers. and but, I don't know. So the interview hall was filled with college students and all these different you know, recruiters. And there were two tables side by side. One was military and the other one was CIA. Nobody, nobody in front of those tables. So I'm thinking, hmm, I might have a chance at a job here. <laughs> so the closest one, I'm not smart enough to go in the CIA, although I did work with the CIA. Uh, I walk up to the military table and I said, uh, do you hire psychologists? And he goes, yes, we do. As a matter of fact, they're a hard to fill category and we'll even pay you a, a, a bonus if you uh, sign up with us. Get out that pen, and that was in April, I think. And then uh, I graduated. Well, I had to wait for my wife. She she was getting uh, she had a one year contract, teaching contract. Then we came here in '68, in July. That's when I started, July 1st. So the guy at work, older guy, says, "What were your What are your hobbies?" I said, "Well, <laughs> I've been in school so long, <laughs> I couldn't do much except study and teach." <laughs> and he said, uh, "Well, before that, I said, oh, hunting and fishing." He said, you only need guns? Oh, yeah, I've got all sorts of guns. And I said, I love black powder. He said, oh, there's something that, that has to do with black powder in southern Indiana every year. He said, you ought to look it up on the, in, the sun, in the Indianapolis Star. Sure enough, it's listed, gives a date. And so I told my wife, we were in a furnished apartment, both working, both got jobs, don't know anybody. We hop in a car and we drive down. And instead of coming down this way, we get lost and we're coming in from that direction. And we come down the hill. There was no flea market there or nothing. So the uh -huh. first thing I see is the gate, and and I tell people I, I told you I told the story to your dad. I said I said in the first five minutes, I saw more muzzle loaders in the flesh than in all the magazines I'd ever looked at. I mean, it was, they were just everywhere. My heart was beating so fast. So I grabbed my wife. Let's let's go over here, you know. So we're crossing the road to go to a commercial row, and here's this guy walking across the road. I said, "Boy, that's beautiful. Where'd you buy that?" I made it on my kitchen table last winter. All right, it's going real fast, you know. I said, well, uh, where do you get the parts? Right over there. <laughs> <laughs> so I left with a barrel, a lock, uh, you know, just the ba basic stuff, and I enrolled in a, uh, a night class uh, in Broad Ripple, which is, uh, it was at the time, it was probably about 20 minutes away from where we had our apartment. And I'd go down there, I think it was three nights a week, and I started working, and so I, I built my first muzzle loader down there. But the big mistake was, my wife wanted to buy one piece of furniture, and in, in the it was a really nice store downtown Indianapolis. And she said, "Oh, I, there's this table. I just love this round table, pedestal table. You got to look at it." And, and you know, it was like $130, and uh, which wasn't much back then, I guess. 
So I will go look at it. I said, oh, Janet, that's pine. I said, where I come from, pine is, you know, cheap, you know. She said, no, this is Ethan Allen. This is really good stuff, high quality, and everybody loves this stuff. I said, well, I don't want to pay $130 for a piece of pine furniture. I said, I'll, I'll make it for you. Big mistake. I made it for $11, and it came out exactly, exactly. I mean, I even distressed that it used, had the same stain, everything. 11 bucks. Big mistake. She said, well, next. <laughs> and, and, and so I, it took me two and a half years to build the furniture in the house. And uh, I made a cannon bed and uh, made a couch, actually, copy the couch. That cog wheel is exactly a, a copy. I'd go in the store when they weren't looking, put a piece of cardboard, you know, trace, trace. Uh, trace something. Or take, take a tape, you know, sorry. But, uh, yeah, so I, I've always been interested in making things. You yeah. Know? And so I cast pewter and... Uh, but I'm at the, you know, being 76, you don't know how much time you got left, and I've got no ears. So all of this, everything at home is going to the Miami Nation. So that'll save my wife a lot of headache, you know. If, yeah. if I go suddenly or get real sick, then, you know. And it'll go somewhere it'll where, go it's, where it can be utilized, yeah. you know. Uh, the gun thing, I'm kind of concerned because I've got uh, a cousin that has two boys, and they're uh, about 24, and one's at MIT getting his Ph.D., in chemistry, and the other one is out in California at a company. What is it called? LinkedIn. Yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if they're gun oriented. They're from Texas, so they should be, because you almost <laughs> associate you know Texas with guns. And I'd, I'd like them to keep the guns that I made. All of the pistols, and yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of muzzle loading pistols. I made, I made four, I think, and then I've got uh, some reproductions that I bought. Uh, you know, I mean, pistols aren't. I mean, they're not dangerous. You can have a you can have a muzzle loading pistol, and a kid can come over and point and click, and there's no no ammunition for it. So, right. I mean, they kind of say there's a process. It's a good yeah. You know, to, to leave it around, yeah. it wouldn't hurt anything. But I I'd sure like to pass them on. Yeah. And then I have some other collectibles. That, but so anyway, that's the end of that story. No, that's so, great. Thank you very would much. You like the water? Um, I if you have one to spare, that'd oh, be. <laughs> I. I know this much compared to these other people. You know? Right. So, I mean, it's already put, been put down. I don't need to put anything down. <laughs> but I enjoy teaching people the basics and, you know, yeah. to get, get through it. Uh, well, but, so, and so many people don't know how to get started or where to get started, but you give them the exposure to those tools and processes. And it's, right. it's not that it's easy, but it is attainable, mm -hmm. relatively simply. Right. Yeah, because I tell people, no experience needed. But I think based on my... Uh, experience last year and this year the two-day course with six people is a killer the first day if we can get more help up here to run this and, yeah. and you know let him go out and shoot because he likes to compete and he can't just be at the station while right. I'm gone all the right. time I might go to a three-day and cut it off at two o'clock so that will give the people an opportunity to come up and experience and participate yeah you know so each day they would have a couple of hours, a couple of three hours to see what's going on. Yeah. Because right now it's eight to five, eight to five. Uh, That's you know, a long with, day, with, especially yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. Maybe because you're because at home I never I'm never on my feet twelve. I mean I'll go out and work in the backyard on bows for a couple of hours, come in, sit down, watch something that I've recorded, you know, yeah. play with a cat or whatever, do the duties that the wife has listed, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, and then go back, maybe go out and work again. Plus all the maintenance is required at a house. And, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, being on the feet for 12 hours is tough. Next June, yeah, if, yeah. if there's a lot, big response, and I don't want to turn people away, we could maybe handle up to 10 people if I had an assistant. I, yeah, in the old, old days, I had one assistant, then I had two assistants. One time we had two, two classes, we had, we had 12. Which was, <laughs> uh, and then a quick story, uh, I had this uh, father bring in his 14-year-old his daughter uh, the morning of the class and said she'd like to take the class. I said, you know, we're, we're totally full, you know, and, and I, you know, I'm going to be so busy, I can't spend time with somebody that I'm suspecting it can't hold up the yeah. same speed as the men, you know. And he said, uh, I said, how strong is he? How strong is she? And he said, well, she rides horses. And, uh, I said, well, okay, fine, you know. First one to finish the boat. And, and then she she was like in love with Legolas, you know, uh -huh. Lord of the Rings. So she that 
the, the day she finished, she goes home at night and she does some kind of elfish writing on the inside of the bone. She brings it back the next day and shows everybody. And then another time, we had a big class, 10, 12 people, whatever it was, and the office calls and said, uh, uh, you have another person, he's, he's a Cherokee, he's coming from the Oklahoma uh, nation, and uh, uh, he was wondering if he was going to have a problem uh, because he has some type of handicap. I said, what kind of handicap? And they said, muscular dystrophy. And I said, what? You know, <laughs> he shows up in a motorized wheelchair. Guess who was the first one to finish the bow? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. That's incredible. It is incredible. So I need to write these stories because, I mean, and then the one I, the one I always tell, a guy, I love this, one of the first classes, so, you know, people are serious and they're, you know, concentrating, so you really don't know how they're feeling about the class, you know? Yeah. So at the end, this one guy goes, He's, and it, the bow came out great. He goes, wait till my brother-in-law sees this. He doesn't think I can do anything. He's going to be so jealous. <laughs> he, he was just high off the ground. And then there was this farmer. I mean, You may have heard these stories. I love telling them. This guy was this big, this wide. He's tall. His big hand, guy. Like, I said, the most delicate tool he's as a farmer he's, that he's ever used is like a 10-pound sledgehammer. <laughs> and and he, I mean, he, he was taking a file instead of doing this he was like whacking it you know i said look, look bill you do it this way you know i i thought his bow is not going to come out and it came out beautiful and he he was just high off the ground he was so happy with it so i i, I keep telling my wife and, I, and my friends people pay me money and i make them happy i don't understand how that works i can't make people happy any place else uh. <laughs> but if they give me money and i show them they're happy i don't get it yeah that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that with yeah. me. I enjoy, I enjoy telling the story. It keeps me going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the uh, last year. This guy comes to... Um, uh, this this girl approached me at, at the feast uh, two years ago, took one of my cards, calls me in February, said, please sign me up, and I may have somebody else to, to, to take. So then in May, she calls. She says, yes, there's, there's, I'm going to take somebody. And I said, well, how tall... Is the person she gave me the, the spe uh, specs, and I, I don't know if I got the name or not. I, I didn't know if it was a, a female or a male. So, the morning of the class, I'm there about you know early setting up, and <clears throat> they walk in. I recognize her, and this guy goes, "This is the greatest day of my life. I can't believe this is just so wonderful." I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "Well, my girlfriend said we're going camping, and I'm not telling you where, but just." You know, be prepared for a few days of camping. And they're from West Lafayette, so they drove down here, after, like, you know, in the dark. They ended up at the Old Mill campgrounds to camp, so he had no idea what this was. Huh. And then she told him, we got to get to someplace about 7.30 this morning. Didn't tell him anything. And so he gets up, and, and she brings him over here. She hadn't been here before, but she, she knew what was going to happen. Yeah. And so she brings him in. And once he gets there, he goes, what is this? Well, the bows. And he says, today you're going to make your own bow. And he's a Mohawk Native American. Oh, that's wonderful. And he's going, this is the greatest, greatest day of my life. And I look at these other guys, I go, she's a keeper. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. That's gonna, incredible. Uh, so the most of your students live kind of in the Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio yeah, area? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I had a uh, uh, guy from England. Really? Uh, and I had, uh, uh, what's the city, is it Jersey Island that's off the coast of France, uh, or Gurney or something like that? It's an island that the Nazis had during World War II, uh, and uh, she, well, and I had a girl from Alaska. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's well, awesome. Her, her husband was somewhere at an air base, either in Ohio or Illinois or someplace. If you like this episode and want to hear more, be sure to subscribe to the Muzzle Blast podcast and follow us on social media. You can find us under at Muzzle Blasts. Muzzle Blast is made possible by the membership of the NMLRA. Thank you. Find out more at nmlra.org.